Welcome to History, Mystery, and the Unexplained, the show where we look at everything from true crime to cryptids, the paranormal, and beyond. Uh, today, we're going to look at a true crime story with an extremely unexpected twist. This is the story of the stalking of Dave Krupa. But before we get started, please like, subscribe, follow, or whatever on the platform of your choice. And also be sure to give us a review. I'd love to hear what you think. Dave Krupa met his girlfriend, Amy Flora, at the truck stop where they both worked. They were together for 12 years, had two children together, a son and a daughter, and it seemed like they were in it for the long haul. But like so many young couples in time, they fell out of love. After their relationship didn't work, Amy took the children and moved back to her hometown of Omaha. Dave followed so he could be close to the kids. It was a new start for both of them. Dave began to put his life together, creating his new normal. He got a job as a mechanic at a local shop, got himself an apartment. In the beginning, his apartment didn't even have furniture. He was 35 back on the dating scene in a new town, thrust into this bachelor lifestyle. He turned to the internet for companionship, someone to connect with. And it didn't take long before he matched with Liz Goyler. Her full name was Shannon Elizabeth Gallier, but everyone called her Liz. She was beautiful and bright. She had two children, a boy and a girl, just like Dave, and they were right around the same age as his children, too. She was independent, had her own cleaning company. It seemed like a great match. But at the time, having just come out of a long-term relationship, he wasn't looking for anything serious. He was upfront about it with Liz. She agreed to take things slow, keep things casual, and just see where they went. And he met other women, too. Uh, casual hookups. He was straightforward with everyone, and there was a, a Mary, a Sandra, a Kathy. He was really just trying to find that new normal, and that's when he met Carrie. Carrie Farver brought her car into the shop for service. Dave was working the counter, and they had just that spark. She took him over to the car to explain what was going on, and they're looking at the engine. They're standing close to each other. The energy was just palpable. They could both feel it. She even talked about it with her friends later that night. He was not Carrie's normal type. She was a computer programmer, a single mother with a 14-year-old. But there was something about him. And... Dave, he was respectful of the situation. He's at work. He doesn't hit on customers. A few days later, however, he's looking at his dating app, and there she is. He recognizes her immediately. So they go on a date, and it goes really well. And at the end of the evening, she goes back to his place. But before things get too heated, Liz actually turns up at the apartment. She had left some stuff there previously. She was very upset, and he agrees to let Liz inside. Obviously, he wraps things up with Carrie and sends her on her way. Dave walks her out, and the two briefly pass in the hallway. It's very brief encounter. Not something that would typically even be remembered if it wasn't for what happened later. After Carrie left the apartment, Liz, she didn't stay long. Again, she was upset. She got what she came for and left. Dave called Carrie to make sure she got home okay, and they decided to resume their date uh, before they got interrupted. Dave went over to her place and ended up spending the night. Before they moved into the bedroom, 
Dave said, Gary stopped him and said, if we're going to do this, if, if we're going to have sex, that's all it is. This, of course, is perfectly fine with Dave. It meant that they were on the same page. He agreed. They had a good evening. Uh, we don't need to go into the details of what that entails. Carrie's friend recalled that after that night, she hadn't mentioned any of the stuff with Liz or the interruption to the evening. She said that she had a great time with Dave, uh, that she laughed like she hadn't in years, and that she didn't know necessarily where things would go, but that she was happy. She was happy with where they were and at that moment, and she was happy keeping things casual. Around this time, Carrie was working on a big project that kept her working late hours, and she lived more than an hour from her office. But Dave's apartment was a half mile up the road. So Dave, despite only knowing her for a couple of weeks, despite the fact that he was seeing other people and that the two of them had agreed to take things casual, he gave her a key to his apartment and told her that she could stay there for a while and so she didn't have to make the long commute back and forth. It was November 13th, 2012, that things suddenly changed. The day started out normal. Dave woke up, got dressed, he gave Carrie a kiss and told her that he would see her later that night. And then he left for work. A few hours later, he got a text from Carrie saying, let's move in together. Again, it's only been two weeks. Dave's still dating other people, still recovering from a long-term relationship. He says, no, I'm not interested in that right now. We don't know each other well enough, and the response is an extreme shift in personality. She comes back with, fine, I hate you. You ruined my life. Dave goes back home after work. Carrie is gone. Her stuff is gone. Her laptop she used for work, the few odds and ends of personal items that had come with staying somewhere, toothbrush, change of clothes, gone. Carrie was never there, and Dave's thinking, you know, I dodged a bullet here. There were a few days of silence, and then the messages start up again. More of the hate speech, profane messages, just out of left field. And around this same time, her mother got a message as well. Carrie's mother. She told her mother that she was going to take a new job in Kansas and, and leave Omaha behind. She also asked her to let someone into the apartment to pick up some of her belongings because they'd been sold. Then Carrie sent a picture of a check. Now, Carrie had suffered from depression over the years and was diagnosed with bipolar when she was in her 20s. Bipolar can be marked with drastic shifts in personality from extreme depression where you can't even leave your bed to extreme mania where you make impulsive, irrational decisions such as uprooting your life, quitting your job, and moving to Kansas. That being said, she talked to her mother daily. This was not something that had ever come up. And she really seemed like she was in a great place in her life. She had a great job. Her son, Max, was just starting high school. And she had told her mother about this great new relationship she was developing with Dave. She had to wonder at this point was her daughter having a mental breakdown, did she stop taking her medication? To make matters worse, she refused to answer her phone or call her mother back. She would only talk by a text. And when she failed to pick up her son from her mother's house to take him to her half-brother's wedding, 
that's when her mother really knew something was wrong. She called the police and reported her missing, but the police really got fixated on the bipolar diagnosis. It seemed to explain her behavior, and on top of that, she was still in communications, even if it was just via text. So they treated it like an adult that didn't want to be found and nothing more. From there, things only got worse. Not only did Dave continue to get messages from Carrie, but Liz started getting threatening messages too. She became the focus of Carrie's jealous rage. At this point, Dave even got an email from Carrie threatening consequences if he didn't break things off. And the email included pictures of a woman uh, presumably Liz, tied up in the trunk of a car. Dave called Liz immediately to see if she was okay, and she was. Obviously, the whole thing was some sort of sick bluff. He said good night and just tried to move forward. Carrie started stalking Dave around this time. She'd send messages to him saying that her favorite thing was to watch him through the window. She knew what he was wearing. She knew what he was watching. Even when he changed his phone number, the messages continued to come. And then 10 days after the first message asking to move in together, Liz's home was broken into. Someone painted whore from Dave on the wall inside the garage. When Liz filed a police report, of course, Dave Krupa's name came up, and that's the first place the police looked. Up to this point, Dave was trying to deal with things on his own. When the police saw Dave's phone, their attention shifted from Dave as a suspect to Dave as another victim. Carrie's mother was getting progressively more and more worried. Carrie was still messaging her, and she was messaging her son Max as well. But she wasn't calling, wasn't coming home. She missed Thanksgiving uh, with the family. She missed her own birthday, missed her son's birthday. She even missed her father's funeral something was seriously wrong. Dave was returning to his apartment one day, and in the parking lot was Carrie's car. He recognized it immediately from when he worked on it that one day that he and Carrie first met. He notified the police, and they came out to investigate. The car had been wiped clean. The only fingerprints were on a mint container in the center council. And unfortunately, they matched none of the non known suspects, and the prints were in the FBI database at all. Around this time, Carrie's mother had a dream. Her late husband, who had just recently passed, appeared to her and told her not to worry, that Carrie was with him. If that was true, then who was sending the messages? Who was harassing Dave Kropa and Liz Gallier? Who was tormenting her mother, her son, her friends? Five months after she originally disappeared, Carrie's mother got a message saying that she had been found and that she was at the at a homeless shelter in Omaha. She immediately went out with the police, but Carrie wasn't there. Her friend got a message from Carrie, too, saying that she had screwed up and 
that she wanted to come home. But again, she couldn't be found. It seemed like someone was toying with them. Max also got a message. Hey, little man, how are you? He was having none of it. He wanted proof. What's my middle name? What is my best friend's name? Carrie didn't answer. Oddly, this behavior actually brought Dave and Liz closer together. They were trauma bonding. They'd been be sitting on a couch and watching movies and the messages would come in on both their phones. Threats, hatred, stalking messages, and and they were scared, but they'd laugh it off. I mean, that nervous laughter that you can get when you just don't know what to do, when your comprehension of a situation moves beyond what is normal and into that new normal. <laughs> Crazy Carrie was at it again. Things continued to escalate to the point that Dave got a phone call and it was Liz and her house was on fire. The police said that it was arson and there was no question about it. Thankfully, Liz and her children were safe, but her two dogs, her cat, her snake, most of her belongings were gone. Every woman in Dave's life was getting harassed at this point. He couldn't meet anyone online anymore. They would start messaging, start getting messages from Carrie as soon as Dave matched with them. He wouldn't even go out on a date. Even Amy Flora, the mother of his children, was getting threats. And to make matters worse, both the police in Iowa who were working on the missing persons case and the police in Nebraska working on the stalker case. They had both hit dead ends. The cases went cold. At this point, Dave and Liz had been getting harassed for more than two years. The police weren't looking for any new leads. A few police would mention it from time to time, but no one was actively investigating. That was until two police in Iowa decided that they wanted to give the case a fresh set of eyes. Jim Dowdy and Ryan Avis each took a side. Dowdy looked at the case as if Carrie was already dead. Whatever was happening, the text messages, the stalking, the vandalism, the arson, that wasn't Carrie. And Avis took the other side, the belief that Carrie is still out there somewhere. She's alive, and she's stalking her ex-boyfriend. This was the first time that the police really started looking at all the evidence, not treating it as two separate cases. And it was the first time that the police didn't just write it off as bipolar. They found that the spelling and grammar in the messages reportedly from Carrie were rife with errors. And this wasn't the way Carrie talked. On top of that, Carrie's checking account went unused. People don't disappear for years and just stop accessing their money. Deeper they dug, the more Dottie and Avis were convinced that Carrie was dead and had been for years. This left them with the question of who's stalking Dave Kropa. One name that stood out in report after report was Liz Goyler. During one investigation, Liz had allowed the messages on her phone to be downloaded, documenting the harassment she'd endured for years. In those messages, the police found a photo of Carrie's Ford Explorer. The metadata on the phone showed that it was taken prior to Dave reporting it to the police. And this meant that Liz 
was somehow aware of Carrie's whereabouts, or at least the location of her car, before anybody else was. To Dottie and Avis, this seemed very suspicious. They also found six phone calls from Liz's phone to Carrie's phone. All of them dialed star six, seven to hide the caller ID. And remember that email that to Dave where Carrie threatened Liz. Those photos of the woman tied up in the trunk. Those photos were on Liz's phone. On top of that, when Dottie and Avis went to talk to Carrie's mother, she shared with them that message about picking up Carrie's possessions from the apartment. When the police looked at the signature on the check from the photo that was sent to Carrie's mom, it was Shanna Gardner, Liz's full name. And that mint container left in Carrie's car, the fingerprint belonged to Liz. The case against Liz was building quickly. When police initially shared their suspicions with Dave, he looked extremely skeptical. He was in denial. Police were telling him that the woman who he's been dating on and off for years, that he's slept beside, who'd met his children, that she'd been impersonating his ex-girlfriend, who he'd only had in his life for a couple weeks, and it made no sense. And Liz, she had her own answers. She actually came to the police station to file a report. And she believed she knew exactly who was harassing her and stalking Dave the whole time. Detective Avis jumped at the opportunity to hear her story. Liz told the detective that she believed it was Amy Flora, the mother of Dave's children, who had been impersonating Carrie. She also shared something else, something very troubling. A gun, a nine millimeter that Dave had purchased for protection had recently gone missing from the home. Davis listened closely to what Liz had to say. To document the harassment she had endured, Liz once again agreed to let the police download the information on her phone and they recorded everything. The day, the day after Liz Gallier sat down with Detective Avis, a 911 call came into the police at Council Bluffs, Iowa. Liz Gallier had been shot. She had just gone on a hike to clear her head, and a woman approached her from behind. She asked Liz to lay down on the ground and asked, how do you like screwing Dave? And then she shot her in the right thigh. Liz was rushed to the hospital, convinced Amy Flora was her shooter. The police didn't buy it. And for the first time, neither did Dave. Liz shot herself. As police dug into the data on her phone, they found that Liz had opened numerous email addresses in Carrie Farmer's name. Liz also had apps that allowed her to send delayed text messages. This is how she was able to receive messages while sitting next to Dave. What they didn't have was Carrie's body. Police needed more information. They brought Liz in for another interview, telling her that they found remains they believed belonged to Carrie. At no point did they indicate that their suspicions were that she was in fact the killer. They played along with Liz's story that it was possibly Amy and asked her to come forward immediately if anything happened between her and Amy. And then they just sat back and waited. It didn't take long for Liz to start forwarding email she claimed was from Amy confessions of her shooting Liz in the park. The cops pressed Liz a little. They told her 
What they really wanted was to know what happened to Carrie. Only if she was comfortable doing so. And it didn't take long. The next email Liz forwarded over from Amy said that Carrie had tried to attack her and that she stabbed her three or four times in the chest. She then burned the body and stuffed it in a garbage bag. She had Dave carry it out to the dumpster, telling him it was trash. The police decided to con the con artist. Avis and Dottie were playing 4D chess with Liz. They really wanted that body, that smoking gun, so to speak. And they knew that what Liz wanted more than anything was Dave Krupa. They had Dave move in with Amy. It didn't take long for Liz to call the police. She was furious. Why wasn't Amy arrested yet? Looks like the only person that benefited was her. So she gets to shoot somebody, and then she gets to kill another person, and then she gets to move in with Dave, and she gets to be free. They told her they still needed more. They needed those details that only a killer would know. Another email came in. Amy confessed to killing Carrie in the car. The detectives took another look at that Ford Explorer they had in evidence, and under the leather of the front passenger seat was blood. Carrie Farver's blood. They finally had enough for an arrest. Liz's attorney asked to forego trial by jury, opting instead to have a judge preside over the case. The main concern was getting to the case before the prosecution found a body. You know, the saying, uh, no body, no crime. As they moved closer to the trial, Avis and Dottie asked Dave Kropa one last time if he could think of anything that they might have missed. Dave mentioned that there was an old tablet he had in storage. He didn't think anything was on it, but if they wanted to look, Go for it. What they found was a tablet that contained a micro SD card. The card was blank, but forensic examination uncovered old data, old photos to be exact. The SD had previously been used in Liz Gottler's phone. And one photo in particular was some very damning evidence. The photo was of a decomposing foot with a tattoo, the Chinese symbol for mother. A tattoo that Carrie Farber had on her right foot. Shanna Elizabeth Gowler was sentenced to life in prison in 2017. To this day, she still claims she's innocent. That's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this story. Until next time, I'm Christopher Damien. This is History, Mystery, and the Unexplained. And thank you for listening.